Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to just have a few opening remarks here at the beginning. I'm extremely grateful that I could be with you all this year because last year I was not. Um, I think the obstacle course that we had to face today to, just to get up to the castle here and to be together just reminds us and reinforces how intertwined and interdependent our lives have become. And that's kind of the theme that I want to talk about right now. And I will begin with a parable, um, a story. Um, it's about an elephant, okay? So a group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought in their village, but none of them knew its shape or form, and out of curiosity, they wanted to inspect it, touch it, and that's what they did. So the first person's hand reached the ear of the elephant, which seemed to be like a fan. And he said, this being is like a fan. The second said, this being is like a snake because he touched its trunk, first of all. The third person hand, hand found a leg and he said, well, this is like a pillar. It's like a tree trunk. And the fourth blind man placed his hand on the elephant's side and said, this is like a wall. The fifth felt the elephant's tail and described it as a rope. And the last felt its tusk, stating that the elephant is hard, smooth, and like a spear. This parable implies that one's subjective experience can be true, but such experience is inherently limited by its failure to account for other truths or a totality of truths. And this provides insight into relativism and the inexpressible nature of truth. It expresses the need for deeper understanding and respect for different perspectives on the same object of observation. And in our case here, for the next few days, our object of observation is Europe, where it has been and where it might be going in imagined futures. As complex systems theory shows us today, a system as a whole cannot be understood or predicted by simply examining each component parts of the system, because it is only the system as a whole that starts to reveal a particular behavior. Therefore, the whole is literally more than the sum of individual parts. We will discuss different experiences, different parts, of the last 30 years in Europe, where some see the elephant as a tree and another as a snake, another as a fan, a pillar, a wall, a rope, or a spear, depending on where your experience touches the object of focus. I would like to include a quote that touches on part of my experience of the last 30 years on many levels um, from my friend and colleague, a founder of IASC, Elamir Honkish, that, that um, Ferenc Mislivas mentioned already. He described what followed from eight, 1989 like this. He said, the complexity of the task facing us is akin to transforming a turbant into a Mercedes while speeding down a highway. Um, although Europeans may have a common history, it cannot be said that we have a shared history. There are, are important differences in the way history was and is experienced in social development and also in terms of legacies. All too often, remembrance of the double dictatorship in East and Central Europe, that is Nazism and communism, which a colleague has said is hard to emerge from a virgin, is minimized at best and mostly and usually ignored. And this has serious and long-reaching implications for democracy and societies in the region today. There was no historical precedent for what took place in the region of East and Central Europe after 1989. There was no coherent plan or template according to which the transformation was to be conducted. The chaotic multitude of changes continually demanded a variety and flexibility of responses which fluctuated from day to day. This created the potential for innovative and creative interventions 
but it also led to grave dangers like the lack of national oversight of public services. What mainly occurred due to international political pressure was the adoption of a Western model with only a very superficial and not a very deep reflection on a possible third way that could have maybe better suited the long-term development goals of the region as a whole, tailored to specific national contexts. What we got was called shock therapy, which countries more recently experiencing austerity policies may painfully recognize. Or we got slow muddling through the labyrinth of post-communist transition. After decades of social division, freedom actually increased distrust between individuals and in groups. In fact, many experienced 1989 as a loss of freedom that practically implied the loss of freedom of irresponsibility. Suddenly, with little warning or preparation, people were required by the new democratic and capitalist framework to take responsibility for their lives and their societies. Neoliberalism replaced any kind of collectivism with the implantation of a kind of extreme individualism that sacrificed solidarity and social cohesion. The feeling of loss, insecurity, and precariousness the new system evoked were soon translated into disillusionment and nostalgia that continues today. After the initial euphoria and excitement, people became disillusioned with political parties and politicians in the new democracies and with the broken promises and institutional rigidity of the West. At least one thing has become increasingly clear. There is a, there is a disjunction between the Western and Eastern European experiences of the past 30 years. The dissatisfaction with state provision in the social sphere led to dissatisfaction with how democracy works. The lack of trust in impersonal institutions and interpersonal relations can be substituted by strong leaders and charismatic personalities. A general attitude of mistrust reinforces the gaps in confidence between the ruling elites and citizens, which leads to frequent crises of legitimacy. In emotionally exhausted societies, where people tend to be mistrustful, two types of destabilization may occur. On the one hand, unpredictable explosions of frozen emotion may revive hatred, popular resentment, and fundamentalism. On the other hand, emotional exhaustion and existential uncertainty and worry may increase frustration and aggression, leading to widespread social negligence and apathy. The communist legacy, reinforced by the hardships of transition, was particularly dangerous to democratic reformers who needed popular support for their policies of transformation. Former Yugoslavia is an example of how fear can destroy optimistic prospects for future development and integration. Permanent crises has been characteristic for decades in East and Central Europe. So crisis is not new. In fact, we realize that crisis is the normal state of affairs here, as it is for most other parts of the world. Permanent crisis is characteristic of the lives of the poor but it is increasingly reaching other levels of societies as well. As a result, we develop different coping mechanisms to deal with the ongoing state of uncertainty. This involves a great deal more than just material resources and includes networks of reciprocity, innovation, flexibility, resilience, and interdependence. The realization that crisis is a normative condition calls for a radical rethinking of the way in which we analyze prosperity, the economy, development, and sustainability. How can we leverage the advantages of the disadvantaged towards a better future? Um, in science fiction novels, the 21st century is usually described as either the century where everything went wrong or when humanity finally got it right due to some miraculous intervention or transformation. 
The existential need for meaning and comfort now require, some believe, a new spiritual revolution or a global awakening which envisions a paradigm shift from a mechanistic worldview to an organic worldview, or we could call it now a quantum worldview, where everything and everyone is connected. The period we live in has been characterized as the end of history, empire, the nation state, neoliberalism, the end of Europe, the end of the world system, and civilizational crisis, which underscores the emergence of new perceptions regarding the human condition. We are embedded in a complex and interdependent world and are affected by the actions of others, no matter how distant or different they are geographically, socially, economically, politically, or culturally. We only have to look at the challenges of a critically changing planet to know this. Complex, independent, and far-changing, fast-changing social realities are increasingly diverging from elite thinking and institutional structures, revealing systemic weaknesses. Political elites pursue, pursue goals that more and more do not correspond or respond to the aspirations of societies. Frequent and dangerous intertwined crises and management failures are bringing into question the reliability of both states and markets as central organizing principles of democracy and sources of rationality. Rising inequality between and within nation states and regions, the fear of further economic deterioration, material deprivation, and unemployment, the intrusion of supranational regulation on national democracies and inter intergenerational challenges are some of the central issues. And those inside the liberal consensus cannot adequately grasp why these things have gone so wrong. And consequently, they still prescribe policies that either do not help or exacerbate the crises. Those inside the EU box are convinced that the of the correctness of their view and do not admit alternatives or tolerate counterarguments. There is little to no room for dialogue in the corridors and offices of decision makers. They, in fact, grow more entrenched, introverted, self-validating, and conservative in terms of rejecting innovation and change. This is aided by their inaccessibility and by the lack of transparency and accountability for the decisions they take, which exemplifies the, per the perception of the European construction today. There is a concentration on imminent causes of crises rather than on root causes, and this displays dif dysfunctional and derivative thinking. The debate about Europe's search for identity and the role and a role in a changing and uncertain world is characterized by conflicting demands of unity, nationalism, economic and social security, political stability, and military realities that are increasing as Europe tries to redefine itself and its place in the world. The discussion of Europe in a global context usually concentrates on the EU and its active role in diplomacy, plus its shrinking relative size globally. According to a recent white paper on the future of Europe, the area of the EU will account for less than 4% of the global population in 2060. No single EU member state will account for more than 1% of the world population by then. The EU share of global GDP has fallen from 26% to 16%, that's what I found yesterday, in the past 15 years. The erosion of values is another problem for Europe and the EU, which are increasingly seen as places where people do not always practice what, the way, what they require of others. So double standards internally and externally projected undermine consensus on common values and leads to further deterioration of Europe's image in the world. Discussions address the EU neglect of the rest of Europe as well. The non-members, mostly candidates or potential candidate countries in the East and the Southeast. Other neglected areas are the internal realities of different EU member states. Their political, cultural, historical characteristics and narratives. 
Europe and the world are experiencing a turbul turbulent reality of rapid and uncontrollable changes that challenge the core nature of the basic categories of, human, of European values, the rule of law, human rights, liberal democracy, and social solidarity. Social solidarity has been under stress for decades as a result of the neoliberal market ideology and the resulting policies like bailouts and austerity plans. Liberalism has been openly challenged by the rise of contemporary populism as well as a multitude of other countervailing movements. The assumption of a linear development in Europe towards a better future, and that means secure permanent upward mobility and the steady increased access to material goods and opportunities from one generation to the next has been undermined in the light of current realities, the limits to growth, interdependencies, and the rise of complexity. Europe and the world uh, and the EU, EU are going through a process of political and social changes that challenge previous expectations and aspirations. Even in EU countries with the longest traditions of predictable processes, unpredictability has become the new normal. Throughout its history, European integration has been positively correlated with the welfare state, and national welfare states were a main driving force of integration and the source of optimism associated with the European project. The European way of life has been and still is inextricably linked with solidarity. This was initially undermined by how integration was implemented in the post-communist countries and was again seriously jeopardized by the way the Euro crisis was mismanaged with extreme constraints put on weaker member states at the cost of their democracies. This happened in the context of a crisis of leadership as well in Europe, which further undermined solidarity. Decades of the dominance of neoliberal thought and practice has seriously eroded this core European value. At the same time, economic, technological, geopolitical, and societal changes have reinformed the need for new forms of solidarity. In many countries, the imbalances in well-being among and within regions have created political problems. After over 30 years, there has been little convergence between the eastern and western parts of Europe, and Europe is becoming more fragment fragmented as a result. Large parts of many countries feel that they have been left behind, and this feeling was compounded by the fear from the politically manipulated threat of migration. Fracture lines between and within regions exist and progressively are accelerating. The impact, um, they impact elections and they have contributed in a significant way to the growth of contemporary populism and to the erosion of EU legitimacy. The contradiction in terms of social justice, economic inequality, and democracy have given rise to counter movements that attempt to reassert control over economic and political forces. The EU is a set of rules, regulations, and institutions, as well as a particularly unique methodology to convey the inter integration of different cultures, economies, and societies has all but lost its credibility. The damage seems irreparable, but this does not mean that we cannot start a new game with new rules and new stakeholders. According to Emmanuel Wallerstein and World Systems Theory, we have reached the point of disequilibrium and have entered a period of transition, of transformation from one world system to another world system. This is what Sigmund Bauman called a period of interregnum and is characterized by high uncertainty, instability, and volatility. I like the term chaotic age. It combines the notion of both chaos and order. The old system is being replaced by something new, but we do not know what it will look like. At the same time, however, in these rare moments of transition and uncertainty, individual action has more power and consequence because we are neither confined by the rules of the old system or the impending new ones. 
Therefore, the age um, in which we live is more open to human intervention and creativity. This is perhaps the time to re-express our common humanity and communicate this through our sharing of experiences of our cultures. So depending on how we view the situation, we are either con condemned or blessed to live in interesting times where our individual actions may have more impact than ever before. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>